Well, hello, and welcome back to that thing we like to call Curlis Mania, where we talk all things pop, rock, and prog. Today we're talking rock, which I haven't done in a while, and I'm very, before I do anything else, I have to introduce my guest, who is first time on the channel, and I'm so happy to have him, Mr. Peter Kerr from Rock Daydream Nation. How are you, Peter? I'm doing well, and uh, thanks for having me on, Tom. I've looked at your show, and uh, yeah, really enjoyed it. So yeah, it's a pleasure. Glad to be on the show. Oh, it's it's a pleasure to have you. I I've been watching uh, I've been watching your channel as well, and uh, it's uh, you know I, it was funny. I was I was just mentioning that one the recent one that I saw that I loved uh, that you were in was uh, with our with our mutual friend Bicycle Legs um, talking about um, the Satanic Majesties, which I just thought was a fantastic episode. Oh, that was a lot of fun. And that's on the Bicycle Legs channel. Yeah, that was just a total gas. Yeah, so check that out. A bit of a friendly argument. Um, a lot of fun. Yeah, everybody hears things differently. And it's just, it was just one of those kind of albums. It's just very funny. Um, and it, yeah, and it's, it, it is one of those records that sort of like has its strong moments and then it doesn't have, it's like it's all over the place. Oh, it's polarizing. And it, and it yeah, it is a bit of a dog's breakfast. But anyway, that's just my opinion. <laughs> Anyway, check out the show it's well worth but that episode yeah check it out if you haven't seen it and by the, and always you know check out rock day dream nation if you if you're not familiar with rock day dream nation probably been living under a rock or something so go check it out i will have the links below but anyway we'll talk more about that later so the stones episode that i saw with them inspired me to reach out to peter because we were kind of having like a little conversation on the on the video and then i said hey how would you be interested in doing the stones on my channel and he said, okay, sounds good. What do you want to do? And we came up with a battle, which is what I do on my channel. I do a lot of battles. The battle, and it's not really a battle. It's just an excuse to talk about these records. And that is, it's only 1974, it's only rock and roll versus 1975, the follow-up, Black and Blue. So these, and, and Peter agreed with me. He said, these are records that just people don't talk about as much. Um, they mm. kind of get in, lost in the shuffle uh, a little bit with between, you know. So what is your what is your take, your general take on these records before we dive in? What is your general? When it was the first time you heard these albums? Do you remember? Look, uh, probably in the, the last 20 years. So they wouldn't have been my first purchase. Mm -hmm. um, the albums that I sort of uh, purchased or, you know, gravitated to when I was a kid was probably Tattoo You. Man, start me up that was like in year seven in high school it was just played everywhere. And, um, you know, I've always said that's probably the last great Rolling Stones album prior to that, when I was a kid, possibly the hits, um, you know, the satisfaction and the Brown sugar just played on radio. And, and, you know, look, the Rolling Stones are a staple of classic rock radio, um, probably, you know, internationally. And, um, yeah so but in respect of those two albums they don't get talked about and i find it it's a transitional album so one of the albums is mick taylor last album and he's out and the next album is sort of like an aud audition album and it, they eventually land on rod wood so um going through the two albums there's a ton of songs that you know are kind of very underrated they're classified as deep cuts. They don't get played in the song list and they're kind of forgotten. So, and these albums did really, really well. So it's just really, it's a, it was a, a real interesting revisit of these two albums because I think it's a transitional period in the Rolling Stones history. Yeah, no, I couldn't agree more. I think uh, under the definition of transitional, uh, you would see these two records. I mean, it's uh, really, you would say it's the end of the, so a lot of people call it the end of the hot streak that they had between, you know, Beggar's Banquet to Goat's Head. Some people include Goat's Head Soup in that. Some people don't. Um, yep. I, don't I don't know where you fall in that, but I, I love Goat's Head Soup. I, it's grown on me a lot. I never thought it was like in the classics, but these days I'm kind of wondering if it is or not. I, it might be. Oh, look, I think that Mick Taylor era is just fantastic and there's not too many bands that have had a golden hot run like you know with mick taylor in the band so i, I agree with you it, it's got yeah. to be rated very highly yeah i really goat's head soup is quite here it is 
I, I bought and it, it kind of with this with the reissue with the bonus tracks I really enjoyed uh, I really kind of like dove into this album again and went oh my god this album's really good I forgot how good this is yes you know yeah absolutely so, but uh, um Mick Taylor what a guitarist Tom what a guitarist and um when I saw the Rolling Stones do their last tour of Australia and um Mick came out and he did mid night rambler so it was great they they brought him back into the whole celebration the show he did a couple of um songs and i shivers were just right up my spine and he's just the tone and he he's easily in my opinion the best guitarist the rolling stones had in their band yeah i can't disagree with that i think it's very true i think there's a reason why those albums are all are are rated so highly by everybody because the, the like you said the tone the touch it's almost like he there's times where it sounds like santana-esque or maybe peter green-esque mm. or you yeah. know where he has that tone and touch where you're like oh that's so cool you know yeah but um, it all comes down to the personality and the fit maybe he wasn't the right personality or the right fit for the band and yeah. um you yeah. know he had some issues so we'll, we'll get into that as we yeah. go into the albums but yeah, yeah. So let's so let's story. let's why not let's let's do it let's jump into uh, it's only rock and roll from 1974. I'll just give a quick. It's the twelfth album they put out. It's uh, was released October eighteenth, nineteen seventy four. As we discussed, the last LP with Mick Taylor, um, and we'll talk about why that was. I'm sure. Um, J no Jimmy Miller also for the first time. Um, mm. This was uh, the, the the produced by the Glimmer Twins, which was the first time that Mick and Keith took that moniker as a sort of production team um yeah but it's funny because you know they've of course they've got andy johns and keith harwood as engineers i'm sure those guys are getting the ones getting the sounds but but they're calling it a glimmer twins production um and so so anyway yeah so go let's jump into this one what do you what's your take on this one peter well i think it's a great album it's highly underrated so maybe we'll just go through the songs and that will give you a little bit of a, an indication of my feelings um sure it's yeah. got a great cracker of an opening track um if you can't rock me um the first thing that hits me is the bubbling bass of bill wyman gee he's missed uh, i tell you what bill wyman and that wonderful languid bass lines all the way through the rolling stones um, Charlie Watts is sturdy with his drum pattern. It's like a machine gun. And then, you know, you've got these Mick Taylor licks that just cut through. It's just got a, such a nice live tone. And, you know, Mick Jagger is really engaged in the vocals. You know, he's really right up yes. front and center. I think it's a fantastic opening track. And, you know, wow, this is, you know, they're, they're plugged in. They're ready to play. Yes. Yes, couldn't agree more. Love the great opener, and and like you said, so much enthusiasm from Mick, and uh, just that locked in rhythm section. And it's really just it's such a simple riff, but it's just it's infectious. It's impossible not to get get going with it. Yeah, absolutely. You know? And then we go to track two, which is um, "Ain't Too Proud to Beg." So this is a, a really nice cover. Some covers they do, I'm not really on board. I'm on board with this one because it's got groove, it's got swing, and the Stones kind of make it their own. So it's the old Motown Temptations hit. Um, I like the arrangement. I love the the very busy piano line. And um, this was a, a kind of a minor hit for the Rolling Stones. So, yeah, I think this is a really nice, tasty um, cover version. And, you know, I don't buy all their cover versions, but this one I think is right on the money. What do you think of it? I, I also, I'm, I'm, I love it. I think it's, I think they do a really great job of it. I think that I'd heard that originally this record was going to be half, half live and half covers or something like that. And so they, they did a bunch of covers and this was one of them. Um, this was the, apparently, obviously the only one that made the record. But um, they did a bunch of covers and they were thinking about doing a half covers record, which is just kind of a strange idea. But um, from what I understand, they were coming straight off the road. So, you know, Keith was like, the band's hot, man. Let's go into studio, and, you know, and yes. uh, kind of thing. And yeah. so they didn't really have that much material <laughs> at the time, I don't think. Yeah, I'm glad they didn't go down that path. That wouldn't have been yeah as good as, you know, no. the outcome of this album. Yeah, No, 100%. no. So, but anyway, but I couldn't agree more. A great Motown cover. Just 
They 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 yeah. kill it. They kill it. Yeah, absolutely. And then you got the next one, which is their one of their signature songs. It's only rock and roll, but I like it. Um, it's the quintessential Rolling Stones song. It's got a great hook. It drives hard. Um, you know, Jagger's vocals are compelling. And, you know, it's basically a mission statement about the Rolling Stones. You know, it's a bit of a statement to the critics. This is what we are. Take us or leave it. So, you know, it's, it's you know, any greatest hits package or compilation album would have this song. Yeah. Yes, absolutely. No question. And what's interesting about it is it's kind of like a faces track, essentially. It's not even really, I mean, they it was recorded at Ron Wood's house with, with, uh, Charlie Watts isn't even on it. I think it's Kenny Kenny Jones is playing drums, and it was like a jam that Mick was at, and he they were just started jamming and they started kind of doing this. I know it's only rock and roll, and it was like, oh, this mm. is catchy. This is catchy. Mick's like, can I take that one? Can I just take that backing track from you? And and then he just yeah. had Keith do some overdubs, and next thing you know, it's a it's a Stones track. But it's 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 fantastic. I mean, it's so it's got it's got that Stone swagger in spades. Yeah, absolutely. A lot of groove, a lot of swagger, and uh, yeah, it's a quint. It's the signature song. It's yeah. kind of the title track to this album. So. Yeah, absolutely. It's cool. Yeah. Then the next one, uh, till the next goodbye. So I think this is a really perfect song to follow through. Um, it's got that nice acoustic strum. Jagger's very wistful, yearning, and he's singing with a lot of soul and melancholy. And um, it's an interesting lyric. It's an illicit, uh, it's about an illicit relationship between lovers. Um, and he's basically calling out through the lyrics, I can't go on, can ya? And um, yeah, it's got a lot of empathy, yearning, um, frustration. It's basically Jagger bearing his soul. And a lot of people think Jagger is a very cold singer. I don't subscribe to that in any shape or form. I think he's got a, you know, he's singing. I mean, he's not the perfect opera rock sing singer, but the way he sings, um, there is when he does soul or where he, he's bearing his heart on his um, sleeve, it sounds fantastic. And I think this is a really strong track. They are on a winning streak on side one, right? I mean, this yeah, is they are. Another yeah. another great track, and I couldn't agree more. It's it's where Mick Mick has his heart on his sleeve, and there's a lot of emotion coming through on this song, and just beautiful beautiful chords. I mean, it's the co combination of the music and the lyrics that just give you give you the it, it hits you here, and um, um, and like you like you said, I love the you know. You, I remember when I was young, I was I was pretty young when I first heard this album. I remember listening to. You give me a cure all from New Orleans. I'm like, what is a cure all? What is that? You, get, you know, it cures all your ills. And I was like, what is he talking about? It's never. It's so funny. I didn't understand what that was. Um, yeah. Well, there's a lot of uh, there's a lot of spicy lyrics in these two albums that uh, you know, as an adult, you go, oh, that's what they meant. You know, oh, sort of I thing. And you know, <laughs> yeah. yeah. But um, they got away with a lot didn't they? They, got they, a, did. they pushed a lot of boundaries and could a band like the Rolling Stones and a lot of their lyrical content survive in 2024, Tom? I don't think so. I'm not sure this, about that. This don't politically so. correct, very straight, 180 type society, a lot of their um, stuff wouldn't cut mustard. So, wow. yeah, I just think it the perfect album for the perfect times so. yeah no i i think that people now would say i really like the record but i'm very offended like i don't i don't yeah. like the lyrics they're very offensive yeah. uh it would be that kind of a reaction but but no a, a beautiful track beautiful absolutely yeah. beautiful. so and it kind of leads into another one for me but oh this is another thoughtful track time waits for no one um lyrics that like ours are like diamonds it's a very thoughtful jagger lyric it's about things just don't last through the sands of time. Um, Mick Taylor's guitar work is absolutely sublime. Um, Nicky Hopkins provides sturdy support with these wonderful piano lines. It's kind of classical. He goes these nice classical runs. And um, yeah, Charlie Watts never overplays his hand. You know, he's just such a wonderful drummer and he his drumming always serves the song. No, doesn't overplay it. And uh, yeah, I just think this this song with Mick Taylor was kind of his swan song. 
and um you know that they, they've never played this live the rolling stones it's this folks is a what that you would call a deep cut and you need to listen to this this is a really kind of a, a bit of a gem that uh, needs more recognition on the album it's a total gem and i i, I that mick mac mick taylor solo at the end that just goes on and on it is so fantastic uh and it's it's so mick taylor it's like mick taylor certified and um it, it's it's one of those songs that like you said a lot of people probably don't know because they don't play it they never mm. play it live and and it's interesting that now that we've talked about these two songs the last two songs on side one apparently those these were the songs that were um that mick taylor was upset about that he said that he should have gotten writing credit on both of them um and i we, st the stones are are hurt are, are very famous for being stingy with writing credits and um it, it's out i mean these two songs are kind of different from the record they i don't know what it is but these two songs in particular do seem a little bit different and it's kind of maybe there is some mick taylor writing going on on these tracks um but anyway that's apparently he was very upset that he didn't get writing credit on these two songs so that was part of the reason and uh, yeah, look, it, it sort of pushed him out the door and um, his contributions to the album, uh, to the, the Stones and that, that run is really noticeable. Mm -hmm. You know, you, you can tell the pre and post uh, Mick Taylor years. Absolutely. Um, yeah. yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So um, so what do you think of or, Side Luxury? Side starts luxury. Off I want to find car, fly Miami too, all the rum, I want to drink it, all the whiskey too. It's a real ode to decadence. <laughs> you know, he's working so hard, I'm working for the company. It's got a reggae beat, and this is sort of like they're dabbling in reggae, they're leading into the what I call the New York years, which is <laughs> the pinnacle of that was probably Some Girls, which I love that album. But they're all leading into... Um, those new york albums um towards the la later part of the the 70s so they're listening to reggae they're listening to dance they're listening to what's in the clubs what's on the charts they're real they're real sponges cultural sponges mm -hmm. um percussion ray cooper is on this the wonderful ray cooper who's been with elton john and paul mccartney so that's a big tick um busy nick nicky hopkins um plays on this uh on this uh track and um jagger sings lead so and really really nicely so richards is on backup i like this song it re it's really sort of some it's kind of the like the rolling stones motive song with a little bit of a reggae beat and you know just an ode to decadence yeah now i i'm working so hard like i said i'm working to keep you in the luxury and uh, you kind of wonder if that's a little Bianca talking about Bianca, but who knows? But um, <laughs> but but he um, but it's I used to think this my my only take on this song is I used to think it was kind of a weak link, and it's funny I listened when I was listening this week I went no it's not I like this track a lot I I don't know if it's just when I was younger I didn't really get it or didn't didn't understand it I don't know but I I really love it now. Yeah, so. it's completely different to if you can't rock me so. Yeah, I just think it's a nice, it's a different sort of start off to side two. And they haven't gone through the, I think that the track listing on this album is quite strong. That It's nicely paced and they've done something that's a little bit different and vibrant, but different to the traditional sort of Rolling Stones rocker that you would expect. Yes, on, exactly. Uh, a little bit of a two. left turn. Yeah, exactly. Yep. So. Dance Little Sister. Wow how much urgency is on this track it's kind of in a rush to get somewhere it's got so much exuberance this is one of my favorite tracks on the album mm -hmm. um taylor guitar licks he just weaves i was actually on the headphones so you had taylor in the right ear and you had um richards in the left ear mm -hmm. so that's a real joy to have on the headphones it's basically 12 bar blues sped up updated yeah. but um wow it's one of my favorite tracks I, I think it's just the stones are on fire on that song yeah like no, it? 
No, I like it. I mean, I, I'm not like, it's interesting. It's one of those where they're just jamming. This might be the first hint of like the next record that's coming where it's, this is kind of like you just said, they're jamming on a, on a pretty basic thing and just continuing it. And it, and mm. the, the only, the, my only crit, slight criticism of this track, it goes on kind of long. Like after a while you're like, okay, dance, little sister, dance. I get it. Dance, little sister, dance. Yeah. Okay. We've said that at like 30. So it gets a little, that's the only thing I'd say about it, but I do enjoy it. I do think it's a rocker. And it's it's still like full on rocking stones, and I I, I do enjoy it. Um, but it does it does kind of hint at like where they're just jamming on one little thing and not really having that many changes going on. Yeah, fair enough, fair enough. Yeah. And uh, the next one is if you really want to be my friend, uh, it's like a ja Mick Jagger torch song, soulful vocals, piano. And you've got the wonderful backup of the Philly band, Philly soul band, Blue Magic. That adds a lot of class. And again, Mick Taylor's guitar licks, you know, got the headphones oh, in, they're yeah. diving in, they're diving out, they're weaving. He's just, he's a class act. <laughs> and um, I think the Stones were lesser for him. But um, yeah, it's, it's an interesting thing. I mean, they did some really great like five star albums after Mick, but you know, I think imagine if he stayed in the band, you know, do you think their run would have continued? What do you think, Tom? I that's a good question. Wow. Um I would It's say, a what if question. It, it's a total what if. And there's a believe me, I'm I've heard that question before. You know, any Stones fan is wonders about that because it's like you know, you always hear mm. Keith Richards say things like, Oh, Mick Taylor was the one that got away. You know, he really was an amazing musician. Uh, and it's like, yeah, I, I think it would have continued. I, I think that maybe they would have gone in a slightly different direction, possibly. That's exactly. What, would yeah. they have done the disco-esque, the, you know, the reggae, the New York club um, stylings of some girls? Would they have continued into that sort of R&B country, more traditional Rolling Stones? Could mm -hmm. you imagine... Um, a Mick Taylor playing um, Emotional Rescue. No, or, sure. miss you, or Miss sure. You or Hot Stuff. I'm not sure. Mm. Yeah, I don't know. Yeah. Because Ron, Ron was always like, okay, Keith, whatever you say, let's do it. Like, he was never arguing. He wasn't arguing. About anything He's a personality. He's the glue. Um, you know, you need somebody in a band who's kind of neutral and like the glue, like the personality glue in mm -hmm. regards to the band and he yeah. was probably the right catalyst you know to keep things going but yeah i'm not sure about mick taylor and doing all that that sort of new york groove sort of stuff that they yeah. did in the later 70s but it's a great what if question it is a great it is amazing it's one of the rock and roll what if questions for sure <laughs> yeah, yeah absolutely yeah but i i'm with you i'm i'm 100 percent in on if you really want to be my friend i, I agree with you i think it's soulful uh, you can hear Billy, yeah. Billy Preston's on it, um, I think. Oh, doesn't he lighten things up? He's just yeah. such a joy. As soon as he comes on, you can tell it's just pops. You know, the song pops out. Yeah, yeah there's love, something about Billy. his playing and singing. And yeah, there's just, it's just, he did it for the Beatles too, right? It's like, it's oh, just, It's like yeah. a switch was turned on. Yeah, exactly you watch that you watch that let it be what was it get back documentary oh it was like funeral you know there you could see it was a band in disarray and as soon as he come on it's like, it's, the, just... it's like the like you said it's like day all of a sudden it was nighttime now it's day when he yeah they, they turned on the sweet light switch yes yeah, completely that was great completely so anyway so yeah so let's so what about short and curlies what do you think of that one? oh i mean you know it's uh it's loose it's to me, this song is probably the lesser of the tracks on this album. So this is the one that I like the least. Okay. To me, this sounds like it evolved out of a jam. Um, Ian Stewart's piano is right up to the right up in the mix, and it's kind of got one melody line that's repeated. It only goes yeah. for two minutes forty three. It doesn't sort of outstay its welcome, but when it's over, you don't really miss it. So to me, yeah. I don't think this is one of the strongest tracks on the album. Yeah, I'm, I'm. This one's okay. It's it's pretty good. I, I enjoy it. You know, it, I like you said. I like. I do like the rollicking piano of Ian Stewart, um, and I do like the. You know, it's kind of a funny lyric, and uh, I do enjoy the kind of. It's just like you said. It's kind of a fun one, but it's not. I wouldn't say it's super substantial by any means. No. Yeah. 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 Not essential. 
And then we've got the finale of fingerprint files. Um, this is loose. It works on a, a Rolling Stones groove. You can shake your ass to it. Uh, <laughs> Mick Taylor's actually on bass. Oh, and okay. um, yeah, right. yeah, I did some research on this one. So Mick Taylor's on bass, but I'm sure people will correct me. No, you're wrong. It's Bill. But right. um, Mick Taylor plays bass, and the bass is the key to this song. The bass is where you're dancing and you follow right. the dance steps. Mm -hmm. um, interesting lyric. It's about government surveillance and monitoring. So Jagger dabbles in politics. He's always, you know, undercover of the night in the 80s. Go back even 10 years earlier, doing yeah. some socio-political or political type of uh, lyrics. So he's a, an interesting lyricist. I like the middle section um, of this song where it goes quiet, atmospheric, and Jagger does a bit of a spoken word. And then you've got the wah-wah and you think, oh, hang on. Is this like um, Shaft? <laughs> you know, am I in a black exploitation movie? Is this like... Uh, so true. Superfly. Right, right. And um, some folk have actually compared this song to some of Sly and the Family Stone. There's a riot going on. So it's got a bit of menace, even at the end where he goes, good night, sleep tight. Yeah. You know, it's like, it's not exactly comforting. It's not like good night with John Lennon on or um, Paul McCartney on the White Album. This is like, good night. <laughs> yeah. You got it with yeah. one eye open. So, right, right. Yeah, I think it's a great closer. They a know really you ain't home. Interesting check. <laughs> a really interesting track. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. No. It's. It's. I agree. They're definitely trying. They're. They're going for an atmosphere on this track, and it kind of starts like a funky jam, like you're talking about. It's kind of a funky, uh, real funky jam, actually. Yeah. Um, and with the with the wah wah and the and the you know the the clavinet. I think there's some clavinet in there. I don't know, but. Um, but yeah, that bass line, that funky bass line going all through the whole thing. And 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 there's one point where it sounds like he's maybe being like strangled or something. He's like, oh, oh, oh. you know, like it's I don't know what he's doing, but he's trying to create this atmosphere, you know. I don't know about you, Tom, but I'm a sucker for Wawa. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you I know, love some of those uh, Stax albums where, you know, you've got, um, what is it, uh, Isaac Hayes, and it's just one one side of just Wawa for 30 minutes. It's, it's got, it's a I vibe. It. It's a vibe immediately. It's a vibe. Yes, yeah. it's a vibe. Yeah. 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 So. And they've got it in spades on this, this track. I yeah. think this is one of the best tracks on the album. And oh. again, it's a, it's, it's nothing you talked about. No, at all. At There's all. so many tracks on this album that are gems and don't get talked about. So yeah. um, I don't know if they played it like, you know, recently or, you know, anyway yeah. i mean i did they play it on i think it's on it might be on this one is it on this record love you live i don't know is it yeah I can't remember but, i mean it's it's yeah the, the, yeah it's on side two of this one but that's that's the only but, time that's it that's it not for a long time and it's on side buried yeah. on side two right yeah so, yeah yeah there you go yeah all right, so then we go over to uh, the 1976 Let's Audition Some Players album. <laughs> How stingy are the Stones? They couldn't the even make a record. decision. <laughs> they, 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 couldn't even, they couldn't even make a decision on Ron Wood. You know, they were sort of like, it's like going for a job interview and keeping you in suspense and you've got five candidates and we'll go, ah, we'll come back to you in a year. Yeah. You know? Yeah, let me let me get Love back. Love the album cover by the way, Tom. Yes. Love the album cover. Yes. And we did this on the Contrarians with the album cover show and I think they described um so there you go. That's all oh. the characters, but if you put the front on, um Bill Wyman looks like um Count Dracula. <laughs> <laughs> he, does. he does. He does. And uh and he um keeps yeah, whispering right. in Mick's ear probably um saying something quite rude and trying to put him off his game. Yeah. yeah. I think it's their greatest album cover. Yeah, Brilliant. Yeah. Shot in Sanibel Island, Florida, apparently. Yeah. So there yeah, you go. I've got a t-shirt somewhere. I should have worn it, but yeah, I love that album. I do like the cover. I do. I enjoy it. Um, Good one. And it's, you're right. I said 75 earlier. It's 76. You're absolutely correct. It was 76. Released, released April 23rd, 76. It's the 13th record. 
and mm. on Rolling Stones Records. That's another thing we mentioned. They're on Rolling Stones Records now, so they can they can do whatever. They have their own label, and they're producing their own albums. So they can do whatever they want at this point. How many bands had that in the seventies, Tom? You know, like Not Zeppelin many. with the Swan Swan uh, song. Per- yep. Purple had their own label. Did I Purple mean, it, have their own label? It, yeah, yeah. Oh, huh? in the UK. Okay. In, in the US, they were on Warner's, but in a, um, in the UK, they had Purple Records, which was okay. a P. Gotcha. But um, that was kind of a sign that you've made it. Yeah. Probably, oh, God, you know, yeah. Sold a, sold a ton of records and you've made it. It's a signature. So. Yeah, absolutely. No, very true. Um, Hot stuff. Um, can't get enough. A vibe song. Can't get enough. Now, if you don't like this being repeated 55,000 times, um, look, I, I will, I'll tolerate it. It's, yeah. it's a vibe song. It's loose, but it's in the pocket. Um, Bill Wyman is just laying down the foundation with this really funky bass line. Charlie Watts hits the drums really hard. I tell you what, I've only seen the Stones once, but Charlie Watts hits is the hardest hitting drummer I've ever seen live. He just whacks it. The drum kit's not big, but man, I mean, he's, you go to metal concerts, you go to hard rock concerts and he's way up there. He just pounds it. Yeah. And um, this yeah. song, Billy Preston, it's got this nice keyboard feels. It's, it's the big hit, but this is the precursor to, um, you know, some girls and it's, they're right getting into the new york studio 54 club years aren't they they're really absorbing the sounds of what's in the in the clubs and on the streets so look it's just it's not much to it when you unpeel it there's not much to it it's not a complicated stone song but i like it it's a vibe song yeah it's 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 an elongated jam essentially right Mm. and and but man the stones can jam that's the thing they can jam they can. and it's like sometimes just listening to them play is enjoyable um yeah and and hearing you know mick saying you know he kind of he kind of gets crazy and he does all these improvisations with the vocals and you know what is it it's people give the people what they want to keep the bodies always moving you know he's just, yeah. he's just making stuff up you know while he's on the spot or whatever and I'd love to listen to an isolated vocal track on that because he goes gaga, you know, can't get enough, you know, yeah, stuff. And he does this little falsetto at the end. I think he's really, he's really into this track. Yeah, yeah. you can tell he's really heart, into it, giving his heart and soul to it, and he, he's trying because I think he was yeah. into this stuff at the time. He was very apparently lived in New York, and he was he was absorbed in the scene. And he was loving it, so he was he wanted the Stones to do it. And I'll tell you, the Stones can. They can groove. I mean, Charlie, you're talking about how he yes. hits hard. He grooves too. Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. They're, they're, they're really into the groove. Yeah. But um, yeah, so. look, um, fine opening track. So then we go to Hand of Fate, and this is more of a traditional sounding Stone song. And it's so okay. This is like what you would expect. Mm-hmm. Um, now you've got one of the auditioned guitarists, uh, Wayne Perkins. Um, he does one of the best leads on the album, but he didn't get the job. <laughs> <laughs> Go figure. Go figure. Um, the guitar sound is gritty. It's dirty. It's raunchy. Um, and it's uh, an interesting sort of lyric. The song's about a man who commits a murder for the love of a woman. So it's got that sort of pulp, pulpy type of uh, sort of storyline to it. But I think the the MVP on this song is Wayne Perkins. Such a sweet tone, mm-hmm. and um, yeah, there you go. Yeah, I I I like the song. I think it, it kind of to me it sort of harkens back to like an almost like an exile song or something, you know? Yeah. I can kind of picture it like a little less fidelity on on uh, <laughs> like a basement song from from uh, from the exile sessions. Um, but uh, I I enjoy it. I I you know I, I, it's not like a five star song, but I I think it's a I think it's a good Stone song. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Now the next one, Cherio Baby, which is a cover of an Eric Donaldson reggae song. Um, I don't like this at all. I find it very stilted. Uh, it's contrived, and um, Jagger's got this uh, faux Jamaican accent. I I find it a kind of an 
motionless experience. So this is goes into the category of when the Stones do a cover and it's bad. So I don't like this song at all. Um, I'm in agreement with you. This is the first miss. This mm. is the, this is not no energy. I, yeah, and it's it, you. You said it. I think you said stilted. That's exactly the way I feel. It's it's not. It doesn't feel like it, they've got it down yet. They're already hitting record. Yeah. It's like, come on, guys, uh, get the song down first before you hit record. It seems like a little yeah. shambolic, you know. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so then we go to Memory Motel, which is one of the few songs where Jagger and Richard share a lead. And that's that's interesting. Yeah. It's yeah. um a lot of melancholy. There's a sadness at its core. Um you know, Harvey Mandel uh plays the um the guitar, Billy Preston on electric piano. Um it's an interesting lyric because it's talking about um a person that could be related to Carly Simon. Read the lyrics. I okay. think Jagger might have been having a d dalliance with Carly Simon. And she's all, it's always been a point of conjecture whether You're So Vain was about Mick Jagger. Did she ever reveal who it was? Wasn't there a story I missed that? I think she did reveal it like not long ago, like recently. Um, yeah. And she said, oh, it, oh, it is about, and I don't think it was, it was Warren Beatty or Mick Jagger. I don't know. I, yeah. I don't yeah. But anyway, the lyrics are kind of, you can sort of read into it. It could be Carly Simon. Mm -hmm. I think it drags its feet at seven minutes. So yeah. it's musically not terribly adventurous. And it's one that I found that it could have been, I don't know, it sounds a little bit unfinished. It need more work on it. So this is probably maybe the second miss on the album so far. You know, it's funny. I had a friend who was a Stones fan and he always loved this track. Uh, he loved it mm. to death. I don't love it. I wouldn't say I love it. I, and I couldn't agree more that I, it goes, it's, it's seven, seven, over seven minutes. Definitely doesn't need to be that long. Uh, yeah. You know, I think if they had trimmed it down, uh, cause I really do like the, you know, she's got a mind of her own and she uses it mm. well. I mean, like you said, the sort of back and forth with Keith and Mick is really pretty cool. And the, I love the refrain of "You're just a memory," but it, but it, you're right. It kind of drags. It kind of goes on too long. Like it drags a little bit. So I couldn't agree. I, I do agree with that part. It's not, you know. Yeah, and because the the track before it was so stilted and lifeless, and all the oxygen was taken out of the room, you probably need something that was like punchy. I don't think they've got the song listing or the song um, selections quite right for this album. I would have put something a little bit more punchy um that would have may have propped up cherry oh baby yeah. but anyway yeah. um so, so anyway yeah so not a, not an amazing end to the side to no side. no and then you've got hey negrita which again in 2024 years lyrically may raise a few eyebrows yeah. um yeah. it's got a very latin sounding um it's got reggae funk so you know the Stones are very into the world music and they're sponges. Uh, it's got a very aggressive Jagger vocal, but you look at the lyrics, they're a little bit chauvinistic. Um, it's very loose. It's based on the groove, but as deep cuts um, go, it's not very memorable. Yeah. 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 It's, it's, it's a, it's another groove song. It's another, and there's there, and this, this album is long on groove songs. <laughs> well it's an audition album so yeah. i'm just thinking did yeah. they just they're, they're bloody sneaky the old rolling stones aren't they yeah you know they get all these um artists in no viewers don't attack me i know they probably knew what they were doing but it comes out like all these audition the auditioning guitarists and let's build an album around it that's right. really weird it's yeah. like getting people interviewing for a job to actually do the job in the end. Right. <laughs> you know, try, try, trying it out. Right. You're not hired, but thanks for all that work you just did. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Going for a job interview. So tell us about the mission statement that you would do for our company to make it better. Right. And then they use it. <laughs> they oh, do thank it. Thank you for that. You didn't get the job, but thank you very much for your, your suggestion. <laughs> thank you. Thank you for your inspiration. Appreciate it. That's funny. Very sneaky. true. Those guys are sneaky. Yeah. No question. Um, yeah. Melody. I reckon that's where it, oh, finally, a soccer I like. It's breezy. It's jazzy. 
Um, Charlie's using the brushes on the on the drums. It's a lot of fun. And Billy Preston plays uh, piano and organ, and he sings lead with Jagger. So it just pops out. It's just vibrant. And thank God, you know, so that's a high point for me. I like this song a lot. Yes, yes. And inspired, they say, in- inspiration, Billy Preston, which to me is code for basically wrote it. I mean, yeah, he did. Now, yeah. I mean, <laughs> so, like, as we talked about, they're sneaky and they're stingy. It's like they're just, I love they the stones, are. but they're a little sneaky. They are. They are very, very, very sneaky. Yeah. So, um, Fool, Fool to, to cry. cry, signature song. It's one of their, their very best. Uh, that's where he's wearing his heart on the sleeve. Um, a lot of soul. I love the Jagger falsetto. Are you a Jagger falsetto fan? You like the emotional rescue? I, I like it. I do. I, I do. I think he gets away with it. I do. I think I like it. Yes. Yeah. A lot of people don't, but I, I love it. I love it. Yeah. And, um, you know, I find this like a cousin to Angie. I put these yeah. two songs. You could put one after the other. Uh, Nikki Hopkins on piano is lovely. Oh, Nikki, um, Nikki Hopkins kills yeah. it. Yeah. 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 To me, this is like the, the morning after song or, you know, they're going night clubbing. You know, they come out of Studio 54, put on the dark sunglasses and the lights up. Yeah. And yeah. this would be the soundtrack, you know, The Fool to Cry. It's like Absolutely. a... Yeah, it's the morning after song. Yeah, I, I, love when he, I love when he does the, Daddy, what's wrong? <laughs> it's just, I love his improvs. They're just so funny. Inspired, yeah. yeah. I mean, you can do improv and just be... But he just seems to nail it. He's yeah. got a good sense of so good at know, it. He's so what good. To, at it. What to what to do? Yeah. So, and then and then yeah. crazy mama. Um, they finish with a bit of a traditional R and B Stones workout. So um, you know Billy Preston again. Um, there's this high pitched uh, cantering guitar lick. I don't know if it's Keith or it's um, Ronnie. So kind of sounds uh, like Ronnie just, to me. Yeah, well, yeah. Um, reading a lot, it, you know, people say it's Keith, but um, okay. it's it's kind of a, yeah, it's the thing that I sort of was attracted to sonically on this song. It's just really nice guitar licks. Um, it's sharp, it's melodic, and um, I know Keith does a lot of rhythm guitar on this, uh, and it fills in the gaps. And I love Jagger's um, annunciation, Crazy Mama, you know, <laughs> so he's really got the American out. And I, I, I think that's why they were such a hit with um, America, because he really um, was a student and a disciple of gospel music, American music, folk music, country music, blues music, mm-hmm. and all those singers and, you know, distilled it into his vocals because he, he doesn't sing like an English man. Yes. You know, with those very clear tones. Yes. He sings like... American blues, you know. Yeah, he's crazy not saying, mama. He's not, saying, he's not saying crazy mama. He's you know. Yeah. He's like crazy mama. Yeah. You know, he's he, he works really hard. That's the one thing about Mickey. He works very very hard to sound like to not sound English white male. You know. Yeah. So. So, there you have it. That's the um, that's the, the the two albums and and thank you for um, letting me revisit this this homework assignment because um, it's just wonderful hearing a lot of these tracks that you know the the deep gems that you know don't get much of a, a play. No. And um, no. I, I guess I'm like you know you you might be like me. There are certain Stones albums because I've got them all um, that I gravitate to more than others, mm-hmm. and some of these albums like these two kind of get missed. Yeah. Yeah. I get a bit lazy as I get older. I kind of gravitate to the the big blockbusters, you know, the yeah. Exile on Your Main Street or the, you know, those sort of albums. Yeah, and I and there's different phases, right? Like I've been for some reason, I don't know why, but I've been digging into the real early, early, early Stone stuff, and I've been enjoying mm. it. Like between the buttons and aftermath and and uh, and yeah. you know, the early stuff, and then really loving it. What did you think of Hackney Diamonds? I enjoyed it. I thought it was good. Yeah. I, but you do, know, you I, do you still um, play it? Do you still play it? I have to be honest. Honest, honest, honest really. question. Not really. 
Yeah. So remember, everyone was on the Hackney Diamonds is the best album since Tattoo U. And I did a show on my channel with Joe B. And I said, in a year's time, will we still be playing it? Yeah. And, um, you know, I, I liked it with reservations, but that's the problem with a lot of these legacy artists, these classic artists, where a lot of their albums may be sensational, but we always gravitate to the, the golden era. Yeah. Yeah. It's hard. It's, it's tough. It's a difficult one. Uh, I do think it was a quality record. I liked a lot of the songs on it. I wouldn't, I don't, I don't think I say, cause how many albums have said, have they've said that about that? It's the best since tattoo you I've heard that or best since mm. something I've heard that so many times. Um, yeah. and it's just like, ah, it's, it's like that for about a month, like you said, and then it's, you know, um, but but I, one thing I have to say about Black and Blue before we stop talking about that album, and that is, it was very important to me because I, you just said you like you love Tattoo You. I am also a massive Tattoo You fan. I love that record to death. Yeah, and I see it behind you. Yes, exactly, right there. And um, I, uh, uh, I can't believe that Slave and Worried About You were from these sessions. And I'm like, what? I said, if those songs were on black, like if those, let's say this is my, this is my fantasy is that you take off uh, Cherry O' Baby. And I know you mm. said you liked Melody, but I would take off Cherry O' Baby and Melody and sub substitute with Slave and Worried About You. And this album would be off the charts. Yeah, absolutely. It would be a lot well, higher. That, that Tattoo You, I got the, um, the anniversary edition and there's one album of B-sides or cuts that didn't make the album it's like a, a standalone rolling stones album it's brilliant yeah. yeah so there's so many songs in the vault tom mick don't be stingy get the combination open the lock Put and just out. let it out there's just out. so much material in that vault there is there's a ton you're right absolutely right there, they've been yeah there's a ton and there's a lot of stuff and there's a lot of they could do like a bob dylan thing where they did the official bootleg they could just put out a bunch of stuff that mm. even alternate versions of what's out there i'd be i'd be i'd buy it in a heartbeat yeah absolutely it's yeah. it's not doing any use whatsoever collecting dust just bring it out and let the the fans enjoy it yeah. So. Yep. so, so we have, we have to hit that moment of truth. I hate to do this to you, but we have to hit that moment of truth where we say, okay, between these two records, it's only rock and roll and black and blue. If you had to pick one, which one would you, which one would you, would you, would you take? It's only rock and roll. I think the Mick Taylor years, uh, it's still, it's a class album and um, I'd give it a, a solid eight out of 10, I think. Yeah. whereas uh black and blue may be a six or a six and a half there's there's some there's some flaws on it yeah 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 and uh you know i i always say i love the the, the cover on this record by too by the way um and uh and i i would say you know i have a habit of agreeing with my guests because my guests are just smart i mean they're just smart people what can i say so i am i am agreeing with peter on this one uh i am also going with it's only rock and roll i, I forgot this is one of those where you listen back and you go wow i forgot how strong this album is. like you said there's yeah. a lot of hidden gems on this album um mick taylor is playing out of his mind and there's a lot of great songs that don't get ever get played yeah absolutely Folks, do yourself a favor. Check it out. It's yeah. really worth it. Dig it out. Take a listen. If you haven't listened to this in a while, take a, take a listen to it. You'll enjoy yeah, it. Absolutely. Yeah. So, well, I mean, I don't know what else to say. I, I think we covered it. Yeah, I think we nailed it. So, uh, no, really appreciate having me uh, on the show. And we've got to do this again. And I'll get you on my channel. We'll I'll find okay. some uh, topic we can guest bag on. But, uh, no, huh. absolutely. It's been a I'd pleasure. I'd love that. Yeah, I'd love yeah. to do that. It'd be really fun. Um, but yeah. thank you again, Peter, for joining me today. I was really, really had a great time. A pleasure. Yeah, yeah. Thank you, uh, and and thank you if you stayed with us this long. We really appreciate it. Uh, what do you think? Maybe some people are in the comments are going to go, "You guys are nuts." Black and blue is amazing. You know, hey, Negrita is like the best track I've ever heard in my life. You know, who knows? So that you know, but so to let us know just in the comments. Let us know. Um, and I will put a link also to Rock Day Dream Nation uh, below, so so you can check out Peter's channel. Um, and um, thanks again for sticking with us. Uh, like and subscribe if you like what you see. And we'll see you next time on Curlis Mania.
Cheers. See ya. See ya.